Hey lovely freaks and welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host Amanda. And I'm Hannah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting really close to the mic because I sound like a freaking fairy. I've been listening to our podcast and I sound like a fairy, so I'm like, I'll get really close to it, then they'll hear me. Yeah. Uh, if you're new here, hello. If you like things strange and unusual and true crime, you can go ahead and hit that subscribe button or the follow button, depending on where you're listening to us. You can also head on down to the description box or description spot, and there is a link that has our social media, Instagram, Facebook, all that jazz. And all that jazz. Thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, just first I'm going to start off by saying someone already uh, checked me on YouTube. They, I said something checked wrong. You? Oh, okay. On the last episode with the Rodney Reed. Uh, I said that he got arrested in Wichita, Tech, Wichita, Texas. Wichita Falls, Texas. In 1997, but it was 1987. Oh. But, you know. Shit happens. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it was, oops. Oopsie. <laughs> Mistakes happen. Mistakes are made sometimes. Get over it. So, Bye. anywho. Um, yeah. But that episode did really well. If you haven't listened to it, I just highly suggest you go listen to that one. Yeah, it was and very interesting. So today what we're talking about is a cult. I say that because... <laughs> a, a, a cult? Question mark. Uh, no, it, this is like a cult. It's kind of has something to do but with But they're like, not saying like they're magic. a cult? Or they are saying it? Uh, yeah, they're, they're, he's pretty much a cult. Like okay. A, yeah. Uh, this also... I'm going to stop saying what we're going to do because I said we were going to do Haunting of Connecticut. Remember? Yeah, and then it every time happen. I say it, it doesn't happen. I like put it out there into the universe, and it just doesn't happen. The universe is like, oh. <laughs> so I was researching the haunting of Connecticut, and I was looking at like movies that were based off of true events, and that was one of them. It was in an article, and I was just trying to get like dates right and stuff. And mm-hmm. then I came across this, and I was like, what? Apparently, this was a movie called Borderland, or yeah, something like that. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen the movie, but um, I read, like, a short description of the movie, and I was like, I wanna, is this real life? And apparently it was. So, yeah. Today we're going to be talking about Adolfo Costanzo, and a lot of this has to deal with, um, well, it's all in Mexico. This happens in Mexico. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of Spanish names in here, so if I get them wrong, sorry about it. Yeah. You know me. And I've or failed. Country bumpkins were not. Yeah, I failed Spanish, Spanish. hard. Yeah. So, me too. well, not really. I made a 70, which I took three years was of it barely and passing. I literally don't remember any of it. Yeah. Maybe. Oh, hello. But I thought it was a really interesting story. So, we're just going to dive right in. Adolfo was born November 1st, 1962, in Miami's Little Havana. Isn't that like a movie or something little havana or havana nights or something oh D- dirty dancing yeah thing yeah i was about to say it and you were like i, I think you read my mind because i literally said it and you were like oh and then i was like uh okay <laughs> <laughs> sort of god i didn't hear your thoughts um his mother was 15 years old and her name was delight del delia 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 okay she had recently fled from cuba and um, we don't know much about his childhood except from what he told his followers. And there were a few accounts from neighbors and things like that. But according to his followers, his mother was a believer in Santeria. Santeria is a mystical religion that was developed in Cuba. There is some debate, however, as to whether she whether she kind of practiced that or whether she was Catholic. She says later on, much later on, that she was just Catholic. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. There's debate about it. There was uh, enough evidence, however, that the Miami police found to suggest that she did practice this religion and also practiced Palo Mayambe, which Palo Mayambe was associated with Adolfo and his narco- Satanist cult is what the media called them. Narco Satanist. So, let me kind of explain the religion now. So, Santeria and Voodoo are kind of similar. And I say that because, you know, we've done one on Voodoo. So, this will kind of help 
people, if they listen to that one, then this will kind of help them understand Santeria. The religions practiced by people are practiced, both of them, are practiced by people who believe in God that is served by several spirits. Santeria and Voodoo also share a similar beginning in African traditions and rituals that originated in Nigeria. The two were brought to the Western Hemisphere by the slaves from North Africa, specifically Nigeria. Since African tradition, um, since since African traditional beliefs and other pagan activities were outlawed and banned in the Western Hemisphere, the slaves infused the pagan beliefs and Christianity beliefs to avoid persecution or death. So, kind of what we talked about with Voodoo. Mm-hmm. However, Santeria is infused with a more Spanish Catholic element, while Voodoo, of course, we know is infused, it's kind of characterized with like the French Catholic element. Mm-hmm. Since Santeria is influenced by Spanish Catholicism, it developed mainly in Spanish countries and colonies. It grew very popular in Mexico and in Cuba. Paulo Mayambe. Paulo Mayambe. Mayambe. Mayambe? Mayambe. There we go. (laughs) I knew I was saying it wrong. It is a more darker form of Santeria. Kind of deals with like black magic and things like that. Um, It also kind of reminds, it kind of reminds me of when we talked about, like when we talked about voodoo and how there are kind of like people that dive into like the black magic version of voodoo. So that's kind of what Paulo Mayambe is. Okay. Yeah. Um, the rituals often include, for Paulo Mayambe, the rituals of, often include animal sacrifices and say sacrifices, the use of human bones. However, it's important to note, though, that they don't do human sacrifices. So they would go to, like, a graveyard, a, a graveyard and, like, grave rob or something like that. Yeah. So they don't do actual human sacrifices. The human sacrifice part is actually forbidden, and that'll come into play later. So, some police reports do say that Adolfo's mother was arrested for keeping their apartment, like, really filthy, and they had a lot of animals, some of which were, some of the animals were dead, some of them were hurt and bleeding very badly. She believed that he was, like, the chosen one in his, like, early on in his life, and performed rituals dedicating him to various gods and spirits to invoke, like, protection for him. His mother believed also that Fidel, F- Fidel, not Fidel, Fidel. <laughs> Adolfo was very strong, like clairvoyant, and that he could speak to the dead. So, like, really early on, I mean, we're talking like a year or two old. Mm. I don't know how she knew that from being a year old, but whatever. Maybe he, like, are you saying, like, he could speak? Are you saying, like, like he could speak? To, to dead, people. dead people. Like, you know, I see dead people. Like, oh, like ghosts? <laughs> yeah, like that yeah, kind of guy. Maybe she saw him, yeah. <laughs> like, talking to him. She had a, yep, that's I'm, Carl. I he guess just, so. uh, Carl just died. How did you know him? You know. When Adolfo was a year old, they moved to Puerto Rico. His mother said that Adolfo was chosen to be a Catholic altar boy because he excelled at this. And he also, during his childhood, was really good at tennis when they lived in Puerto Rico. Adolfo later would say that his mother would have him actually sacrifice the animals and torture them. Mm. She would then praise him for his cruelty. And this was kind of the beginning, like in the very beginning of his early stages, like five years old, around in there. Wow. Yeah. That's young. I think she was trying to like, if that's true, I believe she was trying to like groom him to be okay with animal sacrifices, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. So, they lived in Puerto Rico until 1972, then they moved back to Miami. Since his mother seemed to be, like, a hoarder, Adolfo wouldn't really play with anybody in the neighborhood, and, of course, kids wouldn't come over. His mother also didn't like him playing with children in the neighborhood because she said that they weren't of their religion. When it, So, she, like, didn't, yeah. you know, if they weren't, uh... Part of the cult? Well, not really the cult, but if they didn't practice Santeria or the Paula Mayambe, they they didn't really want them. They might try to change their mind and stuff. Yeah. When Adolfo was 10, he started training in the 
Paula Mayambe, and he started by high priestess, not high priestess, that's a woman, high priest, which is called a palero. So he was practicing black magic from this religion. The high priestess introduced him to a nganga. So an nganga is a iron cauldron that is used in a, in the rituals when he was 11 years old. This is when he kind of started seeing all this. Mm-hmm. The cauldron is how the Palero interacts with the spirit world and kind of like is the source of all his power. The cauldron usually consists of sacrificed animals, insects, branches, herbs, things like that. To invoke the dark spirit, though, a Palero would use human remains, like I said, not that of sacrifice, of somebody who was dead. Yeah. And I think he would, like, help them go, like, grave rob and things like that. I kind of mm. read something about that. It's kind of like a witch. Yeah. Yeah, they have a cauldron. A cauldron. <laughs> yeah. So, it's my understanding that the Nganga, the cauldron, mm-hmm. would obey its Pillaro, kind of like a dog. Like, it would carry out anything that it wanted. So, mm-hmm. like, if it, if the Pillaro, which is the high priest, if he did a spell to carry out something, then it would just obey him. Kind of like it was also, his master or something? Yeah. And also, there was kind of, from what I've read and kind of l- listened to different things on YouTube, um... I believe that the Nganga, the person that is its master, if it ever, like, gets destroyed or something like that Mm -hmm. or broken, like, it kind of hurts them. Not, like, Mm -hmm. physically hurts, but, like, like, eternally. Like, they can feel the pain. Yeah, they can feel the pain. Yeah. yeah. So, there's, like, a really strong connection to the Nganga. That's cool. Um, And he started, like, seeing all this at a really young age However, the his Polero that he was working with wouldn't let him look directly at the Nganga because he said that he was, like, too young for that. He didn't do well in school, but apparently he was really good at black magic. The Polero was working with... The, the Polero that was working with him also was working with, like, drug dealers and smugglers and things like that. And that's kind of, like, the main... Like, there's a lot of um, cartel and stuff that they would work with once he got to Mexico, but Mm -hmm. that's for later. But they would use powerful people like that because they were able to pay them very well for their services. It's kind of like, you know, how Marie Laveau was... Yeah. Excuse me. um, Getting paid by uh, high-up people, people. yeah. To read the palm and everything. Mm -hmm. I got the hiccups. Sorry. Okay. So, in 1983... When Adolfo was 20, he was, I mean, um, he was urged to move to Mexico City. Sorry. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I lost my train of thought. So, when he was going to move to Mexico City, he decided decided to, like, open a business in spellcraft. The religion, like, Santeria and the Palomambe was not commonly practiced in Mexico at the time, but spiritual healing and things like that were. So he thought he could just, like, get his way in by doing some of the stuff that he saw, like reading palms and fortune-telling and things like that that kind of attracted people. Adolfo would... Excuse me. Adolfo would find his sexuality in Mexico City, and when he started dating a man named Martin. So he realized that he was... Homosexual at that point. Yeah, he was gay. However, when they would, they like kept their relationship really quiet. And there was another man that he he kind of had like a, what's the word I'm looking for? Hmm. An open relationship, I guess. Because there was okay. another man that he kind of sought out too. And these two men lived with him and they kind of, he started grooming them as so basically like a cult leader. Relationship. Yeah, but leader? they neither one of them liked the fact that he was with both of them. Mm. But he would just groom them and he would constantly tell them, you know, kind of brainwash he would them, buy like, them stuff. Fine. This and, is fine. Yeah, he was very good yeah. at grooming and which hence makes him a great cult leader and you'll see that later. Because the things that he does, I mean, I would have been yeah. like, huh, peace, I'm out. 
Anyways, so in late 1983, at 21, he was finally officially initiated into Palamayambe and was given his own nganga in one of his ritual in one of the rituals. He was now a full priest. When um, he then relocated after that officially to Mexico City because he was just kind of like going back and forth from Mexico to yeah. and just kind of see showing the people how like good he was at magic and stuff like that so when he moved to mexico city officially and got his own place he opened up a shop also in the zana rosa which is also known as the pink district and it's kind of like a well-known spot for welcoming homosexuals in the area Mm. so because it wasn't Mm -hmm. like being gay in this time in 1980s in mexico was like really taboo so this was like a place where a lot of them kind of flourished and it's also kind of um on you like they're all living together right well these two the two men and him yeah yeah Mm -hmm. it's it's uh, unusual i bet yeah their families did not approve approve yeah i don't know about his mom adolfo's yeah family especially back then yeah but his but the the men's parents didn't approve Mm. He did the normal cleansing and rituals, fortune telling and healing to, you know, get paid. Some of his clients were very wealthy and powerful. They were also law enforcement officials and drug dealers. He would convince high ranking drug kingpins that he could cast spells to make them invisible to the law enforcement. What they didn't understand, though, is that Adolfo was actually bribing the law enforcement officials. So he could protect his clients. So kind of like the same thing we talked about Marie Laveau. She would bribe the uh, judges and the courts. And then, you know, people thought she was... A witch. Or, you know, voodoo queen. They really thought she was because they're like, see? She protects us, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, He would continue to gain followers during this time because the magic, quote-unquote magic he was performing was just, you know baffling and because the drug dealers connections adolfo ended up on a ranch called santa elena so this is a ranch that he ended up i think something happened i'm not sure it it had a long it had been a like it it was like a stopping point for illegal drugs like a illegal drug highway Mm -hmm. but the owner died And so the operation was kind of like in chaos, and that's how he kind of stepped in and took this over. He also got the Hernandez brothers to believe in his twisted version of Palamayambe and convinced them that he could make them invincible to the law enforcement, like I said, and even bulletproof. Hmm. Yeah. I wonder if they test that theory out. Yeah, guys, just run out there and let the bullets hit you. Go ahead. Soon, he took over this ranch, and it was in full operation. Elio Hernandez was one of the brothers, and he was also, like, a drug smuggler. However, their business, in his, on his side of the family, of his own own family, Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't doing very well. I think his older brother had passed away or something, and, of course, this is a drug smuggling business, so it's not like, you know. We're so sad that it didn't do well for you. But yeah. <laughs> what, what I'm saying is, Aww, is like, man. they were kind of down on their and luck. Dreams. And so this is when Adolfo kind of stepped in and promised them things that he would give them. Yeah. You know. Kind of reminds me of, um, what's his name from The Princess and the Frog? The evil guy? Oh, yeah. He's just like making all these deals for people. Yeah. Oh, I can't remember his name. God, I get, the Voodoo King. The Voodoo the Shadow Man. The Shadow Man. There I we go. I could hear it. The sha- Why are you messing with the Shadow, shadow man? man? I could hear it, but I couldn't. Okay. Anyways, um, we like Disney. Yeah. So. If you can't tell. <laughs> Adolfo. So, the Hernandez brothers, they, they were, like, kind of on the verge of going with him and, like, believing all his stuff. But they weren't quite there yet. Mm-hmm. So, Adolfo decided to approach Elio's ex-girlfriend. In order to give them, like, like to get him involved, get all of them involved with his lifestyle. Because he really wanted, like, the Hernandez, and he wanted, he really wanted their business and their other drug dealers that they were dealing with, too. Because he wasn't just trying to 
just do uh, Palam- Palamambe and, and sacrifice people. He also was really trying to be like a drug king then as well. So, on July 30th, 1987, Adolfo approached Sarah Aldriti? Aldrita? Aldrita. Aldrita. I'll get it in a minute. He told, Sarah, he told her that, <laughs> he told Ms. her he was Sarah. a lawyer from Miami and wanted to, like, have lunch with her one day. And he was just kind of swooning her. He was really charismatic, supposedly, is what people said. Adolfo began to draw her into his religion over time because they spent, like, a lot of different days together. Um, of course, he left out the human sacrificing part. But I don't think at this point he was actually doing that. He was just, like I said, trying to get the Hernandez brothers and her and all these other people. All these other followers, basically. Yeah. So, wh- where am I? I lost my spot. I have a question. Mm-hmm. Do you think cult leaders believe in what they preach? Or what do you think? cult leaders want or what they gain like something that they gain from they're narcissistic so they just oh, like attention for people to think they're god yeah yeah okay. <laughs> yeah basically that's it <laughs> um i mean i'm sure some of them probably believe in what i mean according to charles manson he says he wasn't a cult leader he just played in peace and love man and then we just all had sex. peace and love but you know you should kill those people <laughs> yeah <laughs> Peace and love, but hey, maybe you should go kill this person. <laughs> yeah, but peace and love, man. <laughs> okay. Um. So, anyways, like I said, he didn't tell her. He he didn't tell her anything about like the Nganga and stuff like that. He didn't want to like scare her off. He just kept lying to her about a whole bunch of stuff, and eventually, he decided to make her his girlfriend. He would not be affectionate towards her, however, and but would like buy her things so his big thing with anybody was like i won't be affectionate and nice or he would be nice but Mm -hmm. he would just buy them shit basically buy their love i guess you could say yeah and he did that with the two men as well by this time um i think martine was still in the picture but the other man was not so, he, he told her he was bi, which he could have been, but yeah. I, I just don't know. He just used her, basically, to bring in the Hernandez family. And Sarah became one of his high priestess and his right-hand lady, eventually. Adolfo told the Hernandez family, excuse me, who were now, like, part of his cult. And he also, like, kind of initiated them once they came in. He told them that he would take half of their profit, and I thought I kind of thought that was shitty. I was like, "Wait, what?" Um, but he told them that he could increase their profit exponentially because he would magic. So I mean, they kind of were just like half, whatever, take it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if we're making a million a day, yeah, I don't yeah. know, but that's just what he told them. So July nineteen eighty eight, they killed a man named Ramon who was giving one of Adolfo's past lovers problems. And this was one of the past lovers that lived with them. Oh. Not Martine, but the other man. I couldn't have figured out his so they, name. they killed him? Yes. Adolfo and his followers waited for Ramon at a Ramon's apartment. And when he arrived, they drug him to the bathtub, bound him, and covered his hands and his mouth with duct tape. Adolfo then cut off his toes, fingers, oh. and genitals. This was the first time that his followers had ever, like, seen him basically start dismembering someone. Yeah. So, a lot of them got sick, and some of them had to leave. I don't know why at this they point they weren't like, unfollow I'm them? done. <laughs> yeah. Like, Adolfo okay, then... you're crazy. Adolfo then skinned some of his body, <sighs> like, skinned him alive. Yeah. Not all of it, but some. Yeah. He then took... Um, some of his blood in a container and he took his brain and his some of his bones. He then took it to the Zinganga and was beca- at this point he was like becoming, everybody could see like okay he's becoming like really ruthless and his practices are kind of getting out there and yeah. he's kind of becoming like I don't know, maybe he's a serial killer. Crazy, I'm like yeah, yeah. you think? <laughs> so because up until this point 
this is the first person that they killed like that. But before that, he was... He would kill people, but it was just, like, a normal, like, shoot in the head oh, okay. because you've wronged us or I want oh. this, I want these drugs that you have. Yeah. You're a drug dealer, but I want to shoot you. So, it's just normal drug dealing stuff. Okay. I thought maybe, like... Like, mobs. This is never, like, they've never killed anyone no, or no. anything. No. I was this like, was why the first they person. Run? Yeah. Like, this is the first person they, they had killed, that he, they had seen him kill like, like that. that. Okay. Yeah. I felt like I needed to explain that because, yeah. Oh, they just were just like, All went right, right in. Man. Yeah. Um, in February 1989, the cult members killed five people, and this also included a 14-year-old boy. Adolfo was telling his followers that anyone who was not part of their religion slash cult was just like lamb to slaughter. Christians were especially targeted, um, like, big time. He, like, he, like, hated, he thought that Christians mm-hmm. were just, you know, just something to kill basically hmm. he was murdering victims on a weekly basis by the time that mark kilroy came into the picture so now we're going to talk about mark kilroy what happened to him and this is kind of like the downfall of the cult we don't know all of the victims and their stories before mark kilroy so except for the ones that i told you about ramon and yeah. a couple the 14 year old boy but we don't really know anything more of details and mark kilroy was actually from america and i'll get into that and he was um this is a pretty big deal as far as like his his story so march 14th 1989 college student mark kilroy bill huddleston bradley moore and brent martin they were all in Metamoris, Mexico? I think I said that right. Partying. So this was like, many college students would like go and party and this was like right across the border Mm -hmm. from the spot in Texas that they were at. So they would just hop across the border because the drinking age was 18. Yeah. Get really trashed and then walk back across the bridge. So I mean, you know, it was kind of a normal thing. This was also like during spring break so, you know, super fun and all that. Uh, little did they know, they were being followed by Malio and Serafin. So, Serafin was one of the Hernandez brothers. And they were out looking for Adolfo's next victim. Mark and his friends were about to walk back across the bridge into Texas when they, like, that was where their car was. And Mark decided, hey, I gotta stop and, like, take a leak over here in the bushes. <laughs> yeah. And so, he did that. Well, he kind of, like, walked off about 200 feet from where the border is. So, this is not far. They were, like, right next to the border. And the other guys, like, continued walking. And they thought, okay, when he gets finished, he'll just catch up. No big deal. So, they crossed the bridge. And, like, they didn't see him. They were like, okay, Mm -hmm. what's going on, you know? And they waited they waited for an hour, which I would not have waited that long, but whatever. Yeah. They waited for an hour, and they went, they started getting worried, so they went back across the bridge looking for him, but they couldn't find him anywhere. So, they by this point, they were, you know, freaking out. Mm-hmm. The next day, when they still had not heard from him, because they thought, okay, well, maybe he went off with some girl or something like that, but it was very highly unlikely because it just wasn't like him. Plus, he didn't know anybody in Mexico, but yeah. they were thinking maybe he met somebody at the bar we didn't know about or something like that. have to flirt him up quick. And this was before, you know, cell phones were a big thing and all that. Yeah. So, um, when they still didn't hear from him, they decided to go to the U.S. Consul in Metamoris. I can never figure out that word. I'm pretty sure I'm saying that right. People are going to read me. Anyways. <laughs> the con- <laughs> The consul told them that he was fine. He probably just wandered off. He was drunk, passed out somewhere, something like that. He'll turn up. So, Mark's parents went to the Brownville, Texas Police Department. Uh, But since Kilroy, Mark Kilroy, since Mm -hmm. he had not been, went missing in, like, their jurisdiction, he went missing in Mexico. So, there really wasn't anything they could do. So, they had to go to Mexico, I guess. Yes, but however, Lieutenant George 
Where am I? I love that last name. I know. <laughs> <laughs> my name is George. Where am I? Dude, I hate when, like, I'm scrolling on my computer because I write notes, guys. And then, like, it'll scroll, like, way down. And then, like, I'm like, what the crap? Where'd it go? Anyways, um, George Gr- Gravito, he decided that he would go, what? I just was going, Gravito. <laughs> <laughs> he decided that he would go to the um, police in Mexico. So that's what he did because they kind of, like, they had a history of, like, working together. The the police and the, and the city that they were at and then... I guess because they were close to the border, so yeah. they would work together a lot on different cases. But that's cases. so hard because, like, they can't, can the Mexican, like, um, Mexico, can they go into the, no. uh, to investigate? I mean, that's where they America? are, right? Yeah. What are you talking about? Because, because aren't they not in Mexico? Are they in Mexico? No, they're in Mexico. Oh, I thought they I thought they went to you said so many names so many things. I was like, aren't they in Texas? Okay, so <clears throat> they're on the border basically. Oh, okay. It would be like here's you guys can't see what I'm doing, but, <laughs> but it, would it would be, be like, like here's, here's the bridge. <laughs> here's the bridge. Uh-huh. Yeah. Texas is on this side, Mexico's on this side. Yeah. So they were partying in Mexico and then they just walked across the bridge because they parked their car over okay. here. Okay. But he never came back across. Yeah. So, technically, if he disappears in Mexico, it's their jurisdiction. Their, yeah. But, however, which I was about to get to this part, it's you didn't interrupt me, but it's fine. I'm saying that they claimed that he didn't go missing in Mexico. That um, he got, he was, um, the Metamoris, that, that city, those police, yeah. they were like, he didn't, he, did, he didn't disappear here, he disappeared in Texas. Yeah. And they were like, well, that's bullshit, because we know he didn't come across that freaking bridge. So it was kind of shady that they were just kind of throwing it off on the U.S. Like but I think that maybe some of them probably knew Adolfo. I don't yeah, know. Maybe. That's I mean, I was there was a lot of high-ranking officials and law enforcement that knew him. One agency, though, was willing to help um, the lieutenant out from Texas, and it was the Mexican Federal Police, specifically the Drug Enforcement under. Arm under commandment by uh, Juan <laughs> Ayala. <laughs> Shut up. Under arm under commandment. It's weird. I don't understand why <laughs> why it says that, but whatever. I wanted to make sure I, I said all that under because it was a mouthful. So Ayala, he was the the main guy that we're going to talk about throughout the, the rest of this. Yeah. He was the main uh, police, officer police officer here. Yeah. With the help of both police enforcements and friends and Mark's parents, they handed out 200,000 flyers and offered a $15,000 reward for anybody that knew where Mark was. He also was featured on America's Most Wanted, which is crazy. I didn't realize that. And despite all their efforts, though, the case was beginning to grow cold after mm-hmm. just about two weeks. So, three weeks... Later, after Mark disappeared, Ayala and his um, police officers were working with the American Drug Enforcement on one of the largest drug efforts that the two of them ever executed. Because of this, they had put in like a roadblock and they put it along or near the uh, Metamoris city, like that city where they were partying. Uh, one car refused to stop and kind of, like, barreled through the roadblock. After this, it started, like, a high-speed chase because they didn't understand why they didn't want to stop. And no. They thought, okay, well, these people have got drugs in the car and they're going to take us to somewhere there's, like, a drug deal. You know, like a yeah. drug kingpin. Well, they kind of did. They ended up at the ranch, the Santa um, Elena Ranch, the where ranch, yeah. all the stuff was. Then the driver got out of the car. <laughs> this is funny to me. Driver got out of the car and he seemed like super surprised and confused that he was getting arrested. Because remember, Adolfo had told everyone and all of his followers that the police couldn't even see them. That they were like invisible to the police. So that's why they drove away. They're like, well, they won't catch me. And this dude is like, when he gets out, he's like, they can fucking see me? (laughs) Like, what? (laughs) What? 
god. Yeah, I would have been super pissed in that exact moment. I would have been like, this motherfucker lied. What? No, really? Um, anyways, the officers did a search of the property and found hundreds of pounds of marijuana. Wow. And there was marijuana in the van as well. 420. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they also recalled noting a small shed on the property that had a foul, rotten odor coming from it. Mm. When they looked inside, they just, like, peeked through the windows. Yeah. They saw that there were candles, an altar, a large cauldron, or what later they would learn was an Nganga. I love saying that. I don't know why. Mm. Nganga. <laughs> um, and other items, various items. None of the officers, however, wanted to walk in and search the shed because they kind of knew it had to do with, like, black magic. So they were like, nope. I'm uh, good. Okay. <laughs> the marijuana was enough, though, to charge them on a major offense. The driver, um, Elio Hernandez, and Serafin Hernandez, and an elderly caretaker and several other men were arrested and taken into custody. When they got to the station, the elderly man saw Mark's wanted poster, or reward poster, not mm-hmm. wanted, but um, upon the bulletin or whatever, and he was like, hey, I know that man. And the old man told Ayala, the police officer, the main investigator, that he fed this young man when he was bound and held in the back of an SUV on the ranch three weeks earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The caretaker of the ranch, however, didn't know what happened to Mark because, excuse me, because after that, um, he, like, never saw him again. So Ayala then decided... I'm confused. What? What? Did he know him? No, he saw his picture and he knew he knew who he was because he was like, hey, I fed that guy. He just fed that guy? Because Mark was bound in the back of the suburban. Yeah, but back of the SUV. He was bound up. Is he up. part of the cult? No. So the, he's just a caretaker on the property. I but think why I don't we... think he was because he was scared. Oh. I'm, but like because he's an old man who's just taking care of the property, picking weeds and shit. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, picking out the stems. That and he's the... like, well, I'll just feed this guy that's tied up. I don't know what the hell they want one. Yeah. He's just like, cleaning damn. up the blood. I don't know. But he, <laughs> he, 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 um, he was probably terrified. So, And I think he was like a really elderly man. Like He wasn't somebody okay. that could, you know, really run with the, the cult there. Um. You made me lose my I'm sorry, but it was, was I was like, what? I don't understand. <laughs> Why wouldn't you just Why tell somebody? Why wouldn't you feed him and not be like, oh, whatever, you know, it's like a Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it might have been for yeah, them. For um, so Ayala, he decided to question the Hernandez brothers. Serafin, the Hernandez brother, yeah, admitted to them that he and his brother kidnapped Mark. And took him to the ranch under the orders of Adolfo. And as they called him, by this point, they started calling him the Godfather. Uh-huh. So Adolfo got oh, wow. the name the Godfather. Yeah. You come here to eat on my daddy's room. <laughs> <laughs> he said, this is what um, Seraphim said. Seraphim pretty much tells him like all this. He said that the Godfather, remember this is what they call Adolfo. Yeah. Um... He wanted a smart, handsome American who was studying to maybe be like a doctor. Ayala asked, why did you, why did he want this boy like, he didn't ask the parents for any ransom. Because he was thinking, okay, he wanted this kind of upper class American. Because he's probably going to ask for ransom. But that never happened. Seraphin calmly said, well, he wanted it, he wanted him as a human sacrifice. So, like, what? <laughs> So Ayala decided to take the Hernandez brothers handcuffed back to the ranch. Oh, hold on. Okay. Anyways, sorry about that. I had to pause because my dog was barking. Um, and then me and Hannah laughed for a good minute yeah. at some stuff. <laughs> my third smell. Oh man. Okay. So he decided to take the Hernandez brothers handcuffed back to the ranch. Okay. Once there, he told them, show me where the bodies are. Or the body is. Let me rephrase that. Mm-hmm. The body. Because he only thought it was one. Seraphin then said, which body? 
Seraphin wasn't trying to be like a jackass or anything. He just told Ayala there are like several bodies buried on this ranch. So I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And Ayala instructed him to first show him the remains of Mark Kilroy. Excuse me, I have an eye itch. Man, we are all over the place today. No. <laughs> um, Forgive us. He went right to the spot. This is fucked up. He went right to the spot that... I'm not laughing at that. I'm yeah. laughing at me saying that. Where um, Mark was buried. And the only reason he was able to go right to the spot where Mark was buried because there was a wire sticking out of the ground. Ayala asked, what is the wire for? Why is there, like, a wire sticking out of the ground? Is that just to know where the body is? <clears throat> Seraphin explained, no. It is so Adolfo could make a necklace out of his vertebrae because we were instructed to thread a wire through his spine so that way when the body was decomposing, or after it decomposed, yeah. Adolfo could just pull the wire and the vertebrae would come up out of the ground with it. And then he could make a necklace. That is crazy. Intense. Like, yeah. never in my life have I ever heard of that yeah. shit. Crazy AF. <laughs> um, so Ayala was kind of like taken back about how calm everyone seemed to be and yeah. unremorseful as well. So Seraphim said to him, um, like, told him the whole story. So this is what happened the night that Mark. They abducted Mark. Him and his brother <clears throat> saw Mark using the bathroom off the side of the road. They kind of like flashed a fake badge at him and told him mm -hmm. he was being arrested for public drunkenness. And for like, you know, urinating on the sidewalk or whatever. Then they threw him in the back of a van and they drove a few blocks away. Because they were going to meet their, like another man with a different car and drive to the ranch. Mark... At this point, tried to, like, get away, but when he started running, they yelled stop, and they yelled freeze, and Mark stopped, and then they tied him up, duct taped his eyes and his mouth shut. And I'm probably thinking that Mark, he probably thought they were real police. He's thinking, yeah. I'm in Mexico, they're real police, where the hell am I going to run to? So, if they say freeze, I gotta freeze, you know? Yeah. He was then left in the back of the Suburban for several hours once they got back to the ranch and the old man fed him like fed. the old man said. Yeah. Later that afternoon, Adolfo showed up and began his ritual. Mark was drugged into the shed, forced face down on his stomach. Adolfo then cut his skull open with a machete, which, holy crap. He removed his brain and placed it in the Nganga. <clears throat> he believed that since Mark was intelligent and an American college student, that his brain would grant him intelligence and wisdom. Oh, okay. Whatever. After hearing all of this, oh, and then they were able, you know, they <clears throat> threaded the needle through his spine. So that way they wow. could. Why he was like still. No, no, he was dead. No, he was they dead. took okay. his brain out. So, okay. no, he, he was, was dead. Like, oh, my. Which is. I mean, thank God. I'm I'm, yeah. I'm sure he suffered, but it sounds like it was kind of quick, I guess, because yeah. he hit him over the head with a machete. After hearing this, Ayala made the Hernandez brothers start digging up the graves, and he then brought in, like, a backhoe to help. They exhumed the remains of more than 14 people. All of them had evidence of torture. They had been decapitated, burned, castrated, and their hearts removed, even, like, some of them. In the shack, they found a machete caked in blood and human tissue. They found bottles and jars filled with mixtures of blood, hair, and body tissue. The Nganga, there was rotting stew flesh. Mm. It was a mix of human parts, um, animals, and then Mark's brain was also in there as well. Nice. However, they did not have Adolfo in custody. He was nowhere to be found, unfortunately, but Seraphin, during his confession, told police that he had traveled with Sarah, remember his right-hand high priestess lady, mm -hmm. he had traveled with Sarah and I believe, like, his, um, companion. Mm -hmm. At some point, Sarah had started school in Texas and she... <laughs> She was majoring in, like, physical education. So, something, you know, just 
to do, basically, because what she was actually doing was luring victims back to Adolfo. They found this out later. But she was in Texas going to school, and she would lure people back, you know, with, like, the promise of drugs or yeah. partying or, you know, you can come into Mexico. You can come party with us and you have a great be, time, yeah. blah, 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 whatever. So, they thought that he, the, they thought that the couple, they f- fled to the U.S. And they thought, okay, this is bad because they fled to the U.S., we don't have jurisdiction. What are we going to do? They're going to end up just starting this cult over there. The police, however, discovered that the two had been in the U.S. where they got fake IDs. Then they drove to McCollin, Texas and boarded a plane using the fake IDs. I'm not sure why they went to that part of Texas, but maybe there was a reason. Never, never really figured that out. Um... They were headed back to Mexico City. Okay. Yeah. So the police then did an intense search of his homes in Mexico. He had several different homes, and they searched all of them. Weeks went by without anything. They weren't finding any kind of luck, or they, they, didn't, they didn't know where he was. And during this time, they discovered that there were more than 23 bodies on the ranch property, premises. Yeah. Property, yeah. 23 Yeah, more bodies. than 23. That is crazy. Mm-hmm. And then all these people were so brainwashed just to be like, yeah, this is real. Yeah. Um, well, like I said, he was really good. I mean... Very persuasive. Cult leaders are always Malib- manipulative. very manipulative. And he would buy them things. And he was also getting not the best people in the world to become his followers. I mean, they were drug, they were drug, drug dealers. dealers and- yeah. Drug smugglers, human traffickers, things like that. So, you know, they didn't really yeah. care. Well, they probably cared about the intensity of what he was doing because some yeah. of them got sick by it. But they might. They he might was just telling them. Too. Well, he he was the what he was cursed. doing was he was getting the brains and the hearts of people and stuff like that. He was putting them in his enganga, and he was conjuring magic to keep these people protected. Mm-hmm. So why would you leave that? I mean, if you're yeah. brainwashed, you'd be like, oh, well, he's protecting me. I'm covered by black magic. Like, the guy who was running from the police. Could you imagine? Yeah. First of all, why do you not, or do you just think, oh, I wonder who they're chasing yeah. when you look in your rearview mirror, like. <laughs> why are they following me? <laughs> yeah. Maybe they think this van is just driving itself because they can't see me. I don't know. Whatever. So, anyway, That's why he stepped out of the car and he was like, okay, yeah. I'll leave the van. <laughs> yeah, I'll leave the van here. Um, like, oh, no, they can see me. So, the police decided that they would ask an anthropologist who specialized in Palo Mayambe practices what he thought they should do. Like, what should we do? And they decided, like, the anthropologist was like, you need to burn the shack and you need to burn the Nganga and that will bring him out of hiding. Because, like I said, the Nganga is kind of like a part of them. yeah. Yeah. And with TV crews, the police set it all on fire. They burned down the shed, the shack, the ranch, the nganga, everything. And they made sure that the TV crews were there because they wanted him to see it on TV. Mm -hmm. Adolfo was actually staying in a high-rise apartment with Sarah, his lover, and some of the other um, members of his cult, a few of them. He freaked out when he started seeing what was going on on TV. And so police actually the local police in that area, they actually were responding to some other call near the apartments. <laughs> but once they saw what he was doing, they turned their attention to him. So May 6, 1989, when they responded to this different disturbance, they started seeing that Adolfo was actually throwing money out of his window, burning it, and like throwing it all over the ground. He was mm-hmm. screaming out of the window and all this stuff. So, the police decided, okay, this dude's crazy. They arrived at Adolfo's apartment, and when they knocked on the door, open fire began. Adolfo started firing his weapons at them. The police started firing back. For 45 minutes, this went on. One police officer was wounded. But by the end, Adolfo was shot dead. His lover was also shot Sarah, however, was hiding in the bedroom. She was completely fine. Mm -hmm. She and two other cult members surrendered. 
<clears throat> there were a total of 14 cult members all together That's and some that maybe they kind of ran off, you know? Yeah. So they don't really know exactly how many. But these, all these people were charged with the crimes. They were convicted and sentenced to 60 years in prison. And this, we still don't have an exact amount of bodies, unfortunately. So yeah. 23 people... Maybe more is what they found, but they also found just random body parts, like a femur here, wow. a toe over there, like that wasn't a part. That of... wasn't a part of anything, so they don't really know yeah. if they like made that into dust, like Jeffrey Dahmer used to do, and then the bo- or like behind the bodies very well or something. Yeah, I don't they know. done something to them. So yes, that is the story of the narco Satanist cult. That's what the media called them. I just call him, I just call him Adolfo and his followers because, you know, and Mark Kilroy, unfortunately, which, um, can I say something real quick? Do you remember at the end of, uh, is it Mr. Roboto stick song? They say mm-hmm. Kilroy over and over <gasps> again. I, I, I want to look it up, but I didn't, but I, I, I don't think it has anything to do with that, but I've never heard that name Kilroy yeah. ever, except for I'm Kilroy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't think it has anything to do with that, but I had never heard that name and I was like, Kilroy. Kilroy. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's okay. I've always thought that was a really interesting name though. But rest in peace to Mark. His family did get his body. Um, so they got some sort of peace, but there was yeah. tons of families that didn't get any peace because they didn't know who the body parts belonged to. There was a lot. Mm. I think there was like nine for sure that they found the body parts all together but they um couldn't identify them so it's just yeah. crazy because i can't believe i mean i can believe people getting brainwashed into a cult oh dude one day we're yeah. gonna talk about charles manson because that is just some craziness charles manson is a crazy man yeah crazy crazy but i can see why people would get sucked into him because he was very charismatic back in the day. Not now. Well, he's dead now, but like before but yeah, he died, yeah, when he was in prison, he, was he lost really it. Crazy. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but before that, he was very good at like persuading people, you know, and that's probably Making what this guy was like. That you really do care about me. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Finding your insecurities and being like, that's not you and. And it's so funny with Charles Manson. He claims, I never told anybody to kill anybody. Yeah, but you were gonna, you wanted to start a race war, like you said. Yeah. And they were like, oh, okay. You know, this is what Adolfo looks like, by the way. So he's not a bad looking dude. No. That's Mark. Mm. He's a good looking guy. Mark's a good looking guy. Mm hmm. Oh, he just looks like a. a Ad- Adolfo? Adolfo? He just looks like a. A douche. Yeah. He's got the he's got the he's got the eighties chest hair. Mm-hmm. And the we're gonna post that picture. <laughs> he's got, he's he's got so... the chest hair and the the gold chain. Uh. Um he definitely went out I mean he went out in a blaze not of glory, but he went out in a blaze because he went out in a gun gun shootout, which kinda sucks. I was hoping he'd get arrested and like proven that he wasn't a god but yeah i mean he proved that anyways by dying i guess and obviously all that stuff that he did didn't work i want why well also do? i feel like he was just a serial killer and he was just oh yeah for that. sure so he wasn't even doing the the polar mambay mambay whatever he wasn't even doing that right because yeah. like i said human sacrifice was like strictly forbidden so yeah. You weren't even following your own religion, dude. You were just... He kind of just made up his own religion. He probably. just took that and claimed that that's what he, he was probably, doing. He probably... I mean, from a young Apparently age... Apparently, it's a movie. Might, like, animals. He killed animals. Well, his mom made so him, yeah. So, he probably, like, was already a psychopath with that. And mm-hmm. he probably liked it. And then he was like, hmm, you know what? I can convince people to kill people. Yeah. Well... Apparently, this is a movie. It's called Borderland. Hmm. Yeah, that's what it's called. It was made in 2007. I haven't watched it, nor do I really want to, because the picture that I saw of the, like, 
movie or whatever. It was like, you know how, like, if you look up an article, yeah. it'll have, like, a picture. And it was, like, a severed head with a tongue being cut off. And I was like, no, nope, oh. don't think I want to watch it. <laughs> I feel like <clears throat> it's just going to be that. And I thought when I was, when I came across this article, I thought when I saw that picture, I was like, okay, this is going to be, like, another Jeffrey Dahmer or something. Yeah. And then I started reading it and I was like, hey, this is different. It's cults. Which we haven't talked about a cult on here. So she there said we, go. we were going to talk about a cult. And I was like, oh, yay. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> not that we like cults. Cults are. But just like it's something different. Really messed up. Yeah. Like, that's one of Corey's worst. Like, he's not. It's not that he, like, his worst fear. But he's terrified of cults. Like. Yeah. He doesn't like that. <laughs> Which, I mean, who does? But, like, I'm saying. I don't know. I I'm just never... one of those people. I don't follow other people. No, I could never get sucked in. I don't think that's what he's saying, but I'm, me personally, I could just, never get sucked into a cult. I, just do what I need to do, bro. Yeah. I'm just being me. First minute, they were like, let's let's kill people. It's time. I'd be like, gotta go. Whoa, bye. <laughs> this is fun, but uh, it's been real. It's, been, it's getting a little too or real. Even if somebody <laughs> was like, you know, I just think you should go get me an ice cream. I'd be like, um, you go get yourself an ice cream. <laughs> like, I'm just not that. I'm not going to do anything for you. I don't care. But I, I provide. I'm like, I'm, I'm a god. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Is that what you're going to tell your husband? Oh, yeah. Babe, can if you I get ever, me some water? If I, I ever get a husband. You should go get your own water. <laughs> it's going to be bad. You, you know, you can make me a sandwich. Oh, oh no. <laughs> I wouldn't make him nothing. He'd be like, I don't eat here. I just sit and... Sometimes I get some water. <laughs> if I want food, I better just Please, make it Sarah, myself. Can I have some more? <laughs> Anyways, okay. So, yeah, next two. Also, we're not going to do The Haunting of Connecticut. Okay. I've watched the movie. I've read articles. I've listened to podcasts in the past. And it's very interesting. But the one thing that turns me off about it is that um, the people don't seem genuine. I'm just going to say one thing. Like, the mom and the dad from The Haunting of Connecticut story, not the movie. The movie's really good, but it kind of really doesn't have anything to do with the story. I mean, the boy does have cancer, and there's a few things that are the same. But, <clears throat> anyways, the mom and the dad, uh, when they're telling their story, they say that they were... What's the word I'm looking for? Sodomized? You know. Yeah. Sodomized by a demon. Okay. Well, yeah. you would think, if I'm telling that story, I'm going to be shaken up by reenacting, like re retelling it, right? Yeah. But they're always, in their interviews, they're always like, we felt a pinch in our backsides, and then we realized a lot of pressure. We realized we were being sodomized by a demon. And I'm just like, that's not how I would yeah. act. <laughs> like, it's just so, it's very, like, it feels very scripted. Yeah, just like, I think I'm, <laughs> yeah. I think you would be like, I'm not saying that they weren't experiencing like, stuff, but yeah. I'm just saying there's so many people out there that think they're full shit. So, I really didn't want to cover that one. But, um, I don't know, maybe we'll do another cult next week. Probably not, but we'll do something. Right. We're going to have an episode Tuesday for you guys because we're going to try to do do them Tuesday I'm now. I'm going to I'm going to come. Okay. And then we're going to have an episode next Friday. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode. If you did, go ahead and give it a thumbs up if you're on uh, YouTube. YouTube. <clears throat> if you're listening to us on a podcast uh, platform. Spotify. Spotify, anything like that. Follow go us. ahead and. Well, follow us but also give Cheers us like a, a review would you <laughs> shut up i'm sorry <laughs> Cheers Cheers to the world. you can do that too but you need to give us a review we really want some reviews some feedback um if this is the first time you're listening to us we're usually not this psycho we're i think i'm just deliriously tired of when i'm like four hours of sleep i don't know what's wrong with her but whatever <laughs> well let me tell you it started when i was born <laughs> but anyways so um yeah also, we want listener stories. I don't know how many times I have to say this yeah. until I went blue in the face. I want some listeners to write in stories. Please. You know, like Sapphire and, yeah. uh, what's the, um, hi, I'm Sapphire. Want to hear a story? Off of oh, YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> I want Scary to, stories. Scary stories, yeah. yeah. 
I want to do stuff like that, like with for our audience, you know, share yeah. share stories like that. You don't have to have your real name. You can put your fake name in there. You can put a fake story. I don't care. I just think it would be really cool to do stuff like that. Okay, let's wrap it up because this has been an hour. We will see you guys later. Bye. Bye.